Hey everybody and welcome to the Online Ocean Symposium. In this groundbreaking hangout we have the honor not only of speaking with some amazing guests but also coming for, uh, to you live from NOAA's Ocean Exploration 2020. This national forum is discussing and shaping ocean exploration policy and it is the first of its kind. The symposium is lucky enough to have our finger right on the pulse so the question throughout the conference has really been what does the future of ocean policy look like? My awesome guests here today are going to help answer that question, so let's introduce them. Uh, first off, we have in a kind of joint session, David Lang and Chris Jern. Can you guys say hey? Hey. Hi, guys. So, Chris, you are the chief scientist for uh, Deep Submergence for Woods Hole Oceanic Institution, and you've been working on this conference. In fact, yesterday you held a virtual breakout session. Can you talk a little bit about what this conference is and what the purpose of the session yesterday was? Yeah, so the, the, um, the session as a whole has been trying to show what a national program for ocean exploration should look like in the future. Um, the U.S. is a pretty enlightened nation. Uh, you can tell from my accent, I'm not I'm not American, but I've been very happy to move here and work here because it's one of the few countries on Earth that actually has had a policy about ocean exploration, which dates back from a thing called the President's Commission that was held in 2000. And uh, a woman who's the editor of science, Marcy McNutt, has really been the the anchor for this whole meeting to 20 to start planning after a, um, about a dozen years what what the future should be and how we really kick on with how we understand the the, the ocean planet that we live on, and so the the meeting has been about a hundred invited guests for the whole thing of explorers of all different flavors and shapes and sizes from across the across the U.S. and beyond to help shape what a program you know what kind of things are the priorities for our understanding the ocean and hence the earth in the future, and that's ranged from uh, what are the key scientific processes we need to understand, where are the key places in the oceans we need to go to that we don't know about, um, remembering that only five percent of the ocean has been studied and 95% hasn't. Um, and the real thing that we did yesterday was we recognized that part of the key to exploration is actually using modern communications technology. And so for that reason, although the auditorium here at the Aquarium of the Pacific where we've been hosted could only take about 100 people, you know, we had it packed to the scenes, um, but there was no reason why we couldn't invite the rest of the planet to join in the debate as well. And so that's really what yesterday's online um, hangout was for was actually just not only to bring in, there were some key people, we had people out on research ships, for example, who are actually out doing the ocean exploration right now. We're taking time out between fire drills and, and launching their robot submarines so, to come and join in with their insights of what was going on. We had experts from the other side of the country who couldn't be here for various reasons joining in. And then we had basically anybody who wanted to for the website could join in through instant messaging and, and send in their ideas as well. So it was a complete democratization of the whole process. That's fantastic. I'm kind of looking at their portal right now and I can see the various ways that people could interact and actually participate in this. Uh, what were some of the cool things that were discussed or brought up? Uh, there was mention of some sort of party. What are those happening? <laughs> David's hosting one of those, so maybe I'll let David speak to that one. David, can you introduce yourself? You're with OpenROV. Sure, yeah. My, so my name is David, and um, I'm one of the co-founders of OpenROV, and OpenROV really was a, a project that my friend Eric and I started in our garage. We wanted to explore this underwater cave, and we didn't have the tools or the money uh, to do it, so we just started building our own um, underwater robot. And, and the way that we did it was we just we didn't know what we were doing, so we asked the Internet for help. And we created this, this website and now this community of, I guess, kind of DIY ocean explorers at OpenROV.com, and um, we've been here at this weekend um, kind of bringing that perspective because the technology uh, is, is changing. I mean, everybody knows that things are moving really quickly. There are cell phones and iPads and the maker movement, digital fabrication. This is really kind of unlocking um, all this latent potential. And there are a number, of a number of people who are using that to kind of push the boundaries of what's possible with ocean exploration, and we're trying to be a voice for, for those folks. And one of the ideas that we brought up in the, uh, the hangout yesterday was to kind of try and mirror what was happening with astronomy. Because astronomy has done a great job of inviting amateurs into the fold to participate in the actual science that's happening. Um, and one of the, the, one of the big drivers for um, amateur, amateur astronomy has been these star parties that these people have. So they just get together and go out and look at the stars. And, and I don't think there's anything stopping us from throwing similar ocean exploration parties. 
and just get people talking and asking people what they're curious about and what they want to explore. Uh, so that was the that was the idea of the I don't know I don't know what we're calling them yet. No, the citizen exploratoriums, exploratoriums yeah. maybe. Yeah. But yeah. we uh, that's the thing we took back to the the rest of the people that were actually sitting in there like doing things people practically ways, sitting in rooms and great minds mm -hmm. thinking. Mm -hmm. As we took back this idea and said we just want to go and democratize this and have this constellation of parties in the next month that we should just pick up and run with this. And um, we came up with this idea of citizen explorers. And exactly what that's going to do, we don't know yet because it's a democracy. We'll make it up as we go along. But um, one of the things we had this idea, we had these great people from the art center in Pasadena came in, talked to us at dinner on the first evening. And they have this idea that they've, uh, they have this idea they want to construct a movement. We don't know quite what they're doing yet either, but they said they'd model their idea. If they didn't just want to have a campaign, like a political campaign, they wanted this to be a, a democratization. They said they want to model themselves on the Arab Spring, but for people concerned about the environment and the planet and the oceans. So they have a kickoff date of August the 8th. So uh, kind of like what some other uh, ocean groups and uh, kind of kind of what Rethinking.org has been doing, that sort of thing? or uh, this, is, this is purely an artist. This is artists communicating the issues that they, they they basically think we need help getting our message across as, as people who care about the oceans. Mm -hmm. uh, certainly, well, this guy's fine. He's part of the. He's part of the I'm one of the old guys. I'm the old, old the old guard scientist. But um, you know, getting the message across in, in creative ways. So that's what we're trying to think about now is is whether we shouldn't have something that kicks off all across the country, so people can just come join in, hang out, learn about the exploration of the ocean come up with better ideas than we've come up with so far. You know, we want to hear what other people think is important. So yeah, you mentioned citizen explorers and you see all this type of crowdsourcing work with citizen science, uh, you see it, uh, identification and tagging of various marine uh, life, uh, you see it also with things like Google Map Maker where they have mapping parties and people come together from all over the world to actually update the maps of Google and this is something that actually sounds perfect for the ocean world and ocean exploration. Uh, I want to throw it now to somebody who actually was one of the forerunners of ocean exploration and was one of the first people down into the Marianas Trench. Uh, Don Walsh, welcome back to the symposium. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad to be with you today and I hope that uh, anything I might have to say might be useful somewhere, somehow to someone. <laughs> oh, most definitely. Uh, honestly, I wanted to know from your perspective. You actually mentioned in a hangout that you were in on Friday, I believe, with the Terramar project that you didn't start off as a marine scientist. Is that accurate? No, no, hardly. Uh, I was a naval officer serving in submarines. I was a lieutenant, lieutenant for you, Chris. I was a lieutenant in the Navy, uh, qualified in submarines. I was wearing my gold dolphins and. Uh, looking forward to a productive career in uh, deep. You've gone away, and there's some kind of printing there, January 23rd, 1960, uh, and some other people. Somebody spliced in. Uh, hmm. Well, this is very this interesting. Is some uh, footage that we actually found of. Uh, I know there's Don Wright, and there are my feet. <laughs> There's Jacques' head disappearing in a hole, and there's Megan enjoying the whole spectacle. So can you tell us a little bit? a multimedia operation. There's a propeller going around. Somebody up to his arse in seawater <laughs> and disappearing underwater. Andrew, what's happening? You, did you hit a wrong button? No, this right here is a video that we actually found uh, that describes some of uh, the exploration processes and that right there was actually uh, some of uh, the, I believe, bath uh, bathosphere that you went down in. Indeed. In fact, Megan, that is a uh, documentary that I made with uh, Rolex just a year ago on the deep dive, just before Jim made his, and uh, uh, was done, uh, was shown on BBC and uh, Discovery Channel, uh, History Channel in Europe, but. For reasons that escape me, I don't know why it was never shown in the U.S. So I have several crates full of these in my garage. Uh, but it was a very nice uh, documentary. It's just too bad that it didn't have legs or fins, I suppose. Now, see, it's been a long time, Andrew, since you asked the question. I've forgotten what you asked. Uh, I was actually. I, I don't, in my age, I don't remember stuff so good. 
When, when my children come to visit, my wife puts name tags on them. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually asking if you could uh, talk a little bit about the experience of diving into the ocean and going down to this deep place in the ocean and eventually I'm going to try and have you bring it back to the conversation of you know, how that relates to what we're looking at today where you weren't a marine biologist, you were an engineer, and you went down to this great depths and you discovered all this amazing stuff down there. Can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, well, I, the original stream before you uh, showed the documentary was that uh, I uh, was an uh, officer in submarines and uh, the Navy, the Office of Naval Research, had purchased this submersible vehicle called the Bathyscaphe Trieste from the Picard family, and that was January um, 58. Wow. And hello, hi, Don. You Don. Don Wright. Oh, she just popped up in front of me. I, am I talking to you or Don? <laughs> You're still talking to me. Okay. She, she keeps coming in and out of the frame here, and I was. Is this like those things, an uh, emergency announcement? There's a tornado setting down on us? And... Nope. <laughs> okay. I'm seeing a lot of different people. Uh, anyway, I guess that means hurry up. Okay, well, they put out a call for volunteers. I put my hand up. I volunteered. I, I passed their uh, very high standards for joining the program because I was the only volunteer and uh, went to the project as the military commander, the captain, if you will, of the Trieste. That was January 59. As we bought it from the Picards, it could only dive to uh, 6,000 meters, 20,000 feet. So we initiated a program to upgrade it, a new cabin, new pressure hull, uh, and increase the size of the, uh, the float, the balloon that we have that gave us our buoyancy. And by summer of 59, we take it out to Guam. Guam is the uh, site of a major Navy base, but better yet, uh, geographically, it's only 200 miles from the deepest place in the world ocean. We figured that we could probably reach it because it had to be towed. It was too heavy to be picked up by a ship like Alvin is. So we uh, uh, set up our shop out there. We began a, a series of success, successfully deeper test dives, beginning the harbor at Guam, 400 feet, and uh, by the end of 59, we had made a dive to 18,000 feet. Early January 60, we went to 24,000 feet. Everything was working well. We thoroughly tested it. So then we decided to go for the deep dive. So that was in 20 January 1960 uh, when we actually made the dive to 35,840 feet. Um, after we surfaced from the dive, uh, Jacques and I were sitting topside waiting to be picked up by the mothership. We discussed the question of how long would it be before the next people were out there and we sort of synthesized a little Delphi method between the two of us resonating. And we finally agreed that it would be two years. Well, we were off by a half century. It was 52 years. And then that's when Jim Cameron went back of March of last year. Well, I'm going to show a real quick uh, clip Again? of how anybody can actually view where you were through mm -hmm. Google Earth. Um, now, while it may have been a couple of decades till somebody else went and viewed it. No, it was five, five decades and some change. That is quite a bit. Right now, anybody can just go right into Google Earth and with a quick search, find out where that was, and eventually, diving on down, they can see a rendering. I'm getting dizzy. You can see a small dot right there, but it should come into view. There you go. My first command. There you are. Now, again, anybody can actually go into Google Earth and see this. And we are working right now with, uh, we have uh, the great guest, Megan Cook, on the line, who also is working with bringing this world of exploration to the citizens. Can you, uh, and to everyday people, can you speak a little bit about uh, what it means to be a Rolex ocean explorer and what you're doing currently? Absolutely, Andrew. Um, I was selected last year as North America's Rolex Scholar from the Our World Underwater Scholarship Program, which is the premier opportunity of its kind for young people looking to get into the underwater world, whether that's through science, which is my personal background, communication, filmmaking, 
uh, hyper uh, undersea medicine, really anything that happens under the water. Each year there are three scholars selected from around the world and given the opportunity to train and travel and study with the best leaders in the world in all these different fields. Um, I just had a spectacular year. Um, so so many connections, so um, many exciting opportunities. And although my background is in science, my real passion is for uh, getting ocean messages out there and for communicating with other people. And um, I grew up in the desert. And I know it seems unlikely that I'd end up with this career after growing up um, in Boise, Idaho, where we sure do have a lot of lakes, but not, not a lot of salty water, um, so quite a few tumbleweeds. But you know, my, my passion was ignited by um, just people with great ocean enthusiasm and this tremendous drive. And I know that there are so many other uh, ocean enthusiasts in waiting all around the world. And I wanted to help bring the exciting news stories of the ocean and make them relatable and engaging for new audiences. Uh, too much of science has stayed within only the science community. And my real passion came in getting that out there. And so the opportunity I've been working with lately is I was selected as a science communication fellow for the Nautilus Live Exploration Program, which is uh, Dr. Robert Ballard's Deep Sea Exploration Program, which is streaming live exploration now. Um, take you over here with the screen share. So Nautilus Live is the platform that brings all of this ocean exploration um, out. This is a technology called telepresence. These are tethered unmanned ROVs capable of diving to 4,000 meters, um, our ROV Hercules and Argus down here. And there's a live video feed. I won't play this for you because it'll bog down the, the um, hangout here. But we have four channels. The ROVs are actually below. What you're seeing here is an artifact elevator from ship Shipwreck 15577 which is um, also known as the Monterey Shipwreck. It was the shipwreck found originally by oil exploration, explored first by NOAA's exploration program, the Okeanos Explorer, and now being returned to with a, a team of archaeologists from NOAA, from various universities, uh, Texas State Aquarium, Texas State University, um, an amazing team of folks out there. But not only is this science happening, the science is being shared live um, via, uh, via the Nautilus Live platform, where people can send in their questions, chat with a communicator like me. Um, there are educators out there from around the world who get to bring this content back to their classrooms and to young explorers from all around the world. And it's just a really exciting project. I was out for about a month, um, just ending a couple weeks ago. And on Friday, I'll fly back out to the ship and be out there for another leg of exploration. Awesome. Um, you mentioned the Okeanos Explorer, and I know that they also do live streams as well. And it seems like this is uh, becoming more and more uh, familiar and more and more like just the standard procedure of having these amazing science ships out there just broadcasting data, broadcasting video, so that we can bring in all these different interested parties, whether they're scientists or university students or even K-12 through kids who just live in the middle of uh, landlocked areas that don't have a connection to the ocean to be introduced to this amazing deepness. Uh, since we are talking about the deepness, I want to shoot it over to Deep Sea Dawn. Dawn Wright, how's it going? It's going great, Andrew. I'm very honored to be here with uh, such distinguished colleagues and guests here. Well, we are honored to have you. You are the Chief Scientist at Esri. Can you explain to us what Esri is and what that means? Yes, I'd love to, especially with all of the discussion of Google uh, Maps. Uh, Esri is a mapping company as well. We are the world's leaders in geographic information systems. So that combines maps with database and analytical capabilities on steroids. So yeah. we do uh, a lot of the uh, back-end spatial analysis so that you can understand what is related to what else. Uh, you can make predictions in terms of what would be uh, suitable places to uh, design and to site marine protected areas. Uh, we also look at uh, various ways of mapping the ocean floor, but also the water column and the sea surface. Mm -hmm. uh, we provide uh, free maps uh, and viewers and uh, capabilities for people to look at the oceans and the land areas, uh, regardless of whether you're in the classroom for K-12 or you're a climate scientist working for NOAA 
or you are uh, looking at trying to understand uh, the relationship between commercial fishing and uh, shipping and conservation in this very complex uh, area now known as uh, spatial planning in the oceans or marine spatial planning. Mm -hmm. So, so Esri is a privately owned company uh, that's headquartered in Redlands, California, and I serve as the chief scientist of the company to advise uh, the CEO and the directors and the software developers on uh, all kinds of different uh, science innovations ranging from geology and geophysics to hydrology to uh, sustainability science, uh, conservation biology, but also ocean science. We now have a new ocean uh, initiative and we have, uh, we see ourselves as carrying on the tradition of Heezen and Tharp uh, in terms of uh, wonderful, beautiful, but also scientifically accurate uh, oceanographic cartography. And so we're working on an ocean uh, base map that allows uh, people to overlay their data sets uh, on top of this base and uh, either view their data or to uh, do the more complex spatial analyses. Wow, that's fantastic. As a scientist myself, uh, I am uh, leading this initiative across uh, ESRI and we are trying to work uh, on partnerships with scientific organizations, with other information technology companies and trying to do our part to uh, help get the word out about the critical importance of the oceans and also about uh, the many challenges that we face in dealing with the data that we're getting back from the oceans, including the data from uh, the ROVs, even the, uh, the social networking that can happen uh, with these various projects such as with the Open ROV guys, uh, the data streams that they are going to be getting back and that they're getting back all the way up to the most complex data streams that come from the ships and platforms that, that Chris German and his colleagues are constantly uh, dealing with. And then finally, I'm also a professor of geography and oceanography at Oregon State University, where uh, Megan graduated. Wow. Well, yeah. go, go Beavs! <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of connections in here, and that's really great. Well, I'm also... Uh, I'm a courtesy professor at Oregon State also. So, Andrew, you're outnumbered. Yeah. <laughs> when did you go there? Uh, I went to Boston University, so I was right okay. you know, on the Charles River, right on the coast, but um, not quite Oregon. I think I need to go check out the university now. Um, so now that we're talking about maps and mapping, and we've introduced all of our guests, um, unfortunately, a couple of guests couldn't make it because of other commitments and because of technological issues. Uh, Don, I still want to ask you specifically, since this is a question that's been on the ocean community's mind and it was worded in a, uh, in a very specific way, we know more about the surface of the moon and about the surface of Mars than we do about our ocean and our ocean floor. So what does that mean really? Like what does it actually mean that we don't have the same type of data about the bottom of the well, that, that's a, a terrific question and it has to do with uh, the sensors uh, that we have used to understand uh, space, to explore in space, versus the uh, effectiveness of those same kinds of sensors in looking at our own planet. And we normally use electromagnetic energy when we are looking out into space and when we are making maps of uh, other planets because we are, those sensors are very good at looking uh, through, the, through the atmosphere and through space. But if you take a satellite sensor and point it down on the Earth, you can uh, sense the surface of the water, but those sensors are very bad at seeing through the water. Mm -hmm. so we want to have an understanding of uh, the water column itself, the water beneath the surface, as well as being able to see through all of those miles of water down to the ocean floor. We have to turn to sound energy instead. We need acoustics. Hmm. And so we don't yet have, uh, we, we do have a way that we can estimate, uh, and we have estimated what the global ocean floor topography is uh, from satellites, but that's basically just looking at the small undulations in uh, the sea surface, which interestingly enough reflects uh, the differences in gravitational pull within the Earth, which then shows us the high areas on the ocean floor, the mountain ranges, the major mountain ranges and the major deep areas, the major trenches. 
But if we would like to have the ocean floor, for instance, I'll leave the water column behind for a moment and just think about the ocean floor. If we'd like to have a map uh, that is as detailed as our uh, typical street map mm. or a typical hiking map that we would take into a state park or a national park, we need to still go to sea with ships and also with a full range of uh, vehicles, including uh, submersibles, but I think more uh, efficiently now with autonomous underwater vehicles, remotely operated vehicles that are equipped with sonar, which uh, works very well in the water. It's, it's the same principle that marine mammals use to communicate. And that is the kind of uh, energy uh, that sensors in the ocean need in order to make these more detailed maps. So when you think about going to sea with those kinds of sensors, and if you are relying uh, primarily on ships or vehicles. Well, a research vessel travels along the surface of the ocean uh, surveying with sonar uh, about the same speed that uh, you might ride your bicycle uh, to go to the store or to, to get somewhere on campus. And that's my mom in the background, in case you're in the hotel room. <laughs> so, so think about trying to, to map large areas of the ocean floor at the speed that you ride your bicycle. That's going to take some time. Yeah, especially with how large the, the ocean is. Yeah. But you know, we were talking about yesterday, we were talking with the people who are working at Google Ocean, and now GoPro has the, you know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen, Google Ocean now has this street view, but it's in very limited locations. Um, it's in just a few places around the Great Barrier Reef. But we were looking at the GoPro mounts. Which, you know, they're a couple thousand bucks, but you can attach them potentially to an open ROV, and then everyone could be out there helping to map and do that. And I think that's really, really exciting that this is something that, yeah, it's a huge, huge thing, but maybe that's something we can we can all contribute to. I, I, I'm really excited about that. So that yeah, data that you're talking about that was actually the uh, Ocean Street View was actually provided by Catlin Seaview Survey, and they use these underwater 360-degree cameras uh, that they actually, I forget if they bought or they had made specifically for this project, but they're trying to extend that out as far uh, a reach as possible and trying to partner with various other groups. So, David, in question about that, how easy do you think that it would be to actually develop a ROV model that would have a 360 degree camera and would be able to be optioned out for, say, some sort of low price? So, um, yeah, I was just going to say, how much do you think those, I don't I have any idea how much those Catlin CVU things cost. Probably really expensive. They yeah. are pretty awesome, and I want one. So, <laughs> sure, but but but, yeah. then, but that's not going to get the, the amount of, of data that we need if there's just one in, or two of these. In deep sea engineering, there's a phrase we have, the perfect is the enemy of good enough. Yeah. And there's a whole lot of stuff we could learn immediately with any camera. You know, David's open ROV project with Eric has put out, what, 500 of these ROVs already yeah. around the planet. People have them. They can go do stuff with them, and they have cameras. They can go learn tomorrow about new places people haven't looked before. And it may not be the prettiest stuff, but it's going to be, you know, it's it's infinitely better than what we have right now, which is a black screen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so and it's getting, and then that's 500 more people who care a lot about, you know, sending sending vessels and auto developing autonomous vehicles to get those deeper parts, right, to support the other work. I think that's really critical, and and. You know, you ask, is it possible? Of course, it's possible. You know, this, this you know, w people have been showing me these these GoPros that are that you can mount in like six different ways, <laughs> and that potentially this could do it. I mean, I just learned about it now, and we've been geeking out. You know, us in the Google Ocean team. Let's try this. You know, the technology is moving so fast, and it's getting so much more accessible that you know it's hard for any of us to keep up. Even someone like me who's staring at this stuff all day. And I think widening the net to some of these other these other technologies. I mean, you know, we all every one of us has a smartphone in our pocket. You know, and and the the things that are that are uh, the forces that are driving that these cheaper sensors, these cheaper cameras. Um, let's start like taking that technology and applying it. Yeah, most yeah. definitely. Um, I know that Megan had a point that she wanted to make on this. Um, Megan, would you mind uh, jumping in on that? No problem. Uh, I. I think it's so exciting to see this new technology developing, not only for the deep, not only for these areas that we've literally never gone before, but I think it, to help people understand how much more we have to look, it's exciting to see these technologies move into the diving, either the recreational or the technical diving, in the shallower water sites as well. If people could start mapping 
the places they go and putting that on a global scale, I think they'd realize how tiny these places that are really frequently used are. And I think it would um, provide a really great global context to have people understand, like, oh, yeah, people boat out there, people dive out there, but, but that's this much, and we have so much more to look for. I think it's exciting to see both really deep technical applications and also, you know, your, your at-home piece of the ocean that you love near shore getting mapped as well. Yeah, most yeah. definitely like an identifier. Don, you had a, a point on this? Yes, yes, I wanted to uh, wanted to share a couple of things because I think uh, the point that uh, David is making about the, the crowdsourcing efforts is terrific, and uh, I think there's no one entity that's going to be able to handle all of this. We all have to work together. Uh, we're all going to be collecting data and sharing data, uh, and with regard to that, I'm going to try to see if I can use the screen share. It's on the left, yeah. And so what you should be seeing now is a story map, which uh, is using uh, mapping uh, templates, open source mapping templates that, that we're providing at Esri now to help people to, uh, to get their crowdsource uh, data and photographs uh, out there, but uh, in a map format that combines uh, the photography in the case of this diver, going after uh, Megan's uh, example here, a diver went to all of these various sites around the Cayman Islands and took these underwater photographs but also recorded uh, very interesting citizen science observations and recorded geographic uh, locations and then put this into a very beautiful uh, what we call a story map because it's telling a story from the data from the geographic data and also from the, the photography and we have uh, a bit of a movement that's going on here with Esri we don't want uh, Google to have to handle mapping the oceans all alone we're working very very hard to uh, contribute to this as well and would like to to, uh, to work with them and work with, with others. And so this is just uh, one example. And then there's another example. I'm not sure if my screen share is capturing uh, is capturing this. But with regard to uh, the underwater photography is extremely important. But uh, what I was trying to uh, talk about is the actual base map of the bathymetry which is uh, the underlay uh, over which you can put locations of where you have gone with Street View or where you've gone with other kinds of vehicles, ROVs. Uh, you can put uh, the other kinds of salinity, temperature, uh, the cloudiness of the water, uh, turbulence, uh, currents, and so forth. And in this case, the Virginia Institute of Marine Science has created this story map uh, using our free template to identify the places where they are monitoring and assessing the largest fish along the principle of the big fat females that we want to be able to preserve uh, in terms of keeping all of these uh, species, in this case in the Chesapeake Bay, healthy. And so they have created this story map that shows the locations on a cartographically beautiful base map on the right, their photography on the left, and then the artist uh, renditions of these different kinds of species so that not only scientists can, under, can uh, relate to this, but that the general public can relate to this as well. So I think this is exciting, an exciting uh, new area, era that we're moving into. Most definitely. I also wanted to show, I mean, that, that is some fantastic data sets. Those are some fantastic uses of the base map. I also wanted to bring it in just a really quick sec, and then I'm going to throw it over to uh, Chris. Um, when we're looking at this, we also have to keep thinking about what the future is. I mean, everybody these days has their own video camera, photo, uh, and, and GPS locator that they just automatically upload things just based off of their phone. So being able to utilize this technology for the ocean, there's not just uh, the concept of capturing this base data, but also adapting that data into a usable uh, way that can address a large spectrum of an audience. Going back really quickly to the Catlin Sea View, like looking at this type of footage, we can actually have this in sort of an augmented reality section where, oh, I am wondering what this type of uh, animal is right here, and just by clicking on it, I would be able to uh, gain more information of it, not just being able to look at these uh, photos, but being able to actually get more information out of it. Uh, Chris, you had a point on this, or was it David? That's, no, it's, yeah, that's me. Um, so I think there were two points I'd, I'd 
was thinking about this, this whole citizen explorer concept of, of where it's going to go in the future. And I think, you know, Andrew and I are probably like the, at the two different ends of the spectrum of, of where that's coming from, but how it, you know, both things are going to be part of our future, I'm sure. The first one is, is picking up on the new technologies, the, the telepresence that Megan was talking about just now and the exploration now. You know, we have these abilities to bring all these feeds ashore. And scientists are using them, you know, and we've, we're developing techniques now of how someone like me doesn't have to actually go out and lead an expedition and be on the ship anymore. I can probably lead it from home if the pilots are out there driving the ROVs. So that's the kind of thing at the Inner Space Center down in, in Rhode Island, which is, we're hoping where one of our parties is going to be in the next few weeks, um, we'll be able to do. And, and then the thing is, well, if we can bring that data ashore, why does it only have to be the scientists looking at it? You know, it would be a really cool way to start thinking about what are the kind of projects where and Dawn was just showing those great photos from the Cayman Islands. And I was just there 40 uh, miles south of there for the last month. And we were broadcasting video feeds to YouTube. So we've got how to do the one-way thing. And you can go revisit the dives with us anytime you like now. They're there forever. But wouldn't it be neat if in the future people can actually be sitting there? I've had this experience before where I was sitting exploring some new sites down that way a couple of years ago. And a voice came in my ear from a headset. And it was a, a colleague of mine back in England saying, stop talking about those rocks, you idiot. Look at those really cool animals over to the left. Turn the camera. And I could do that. We could turn the ROV around. And so there's no reason why we can't actually have that kind of, you know, citizens can be involved in the really deep sea exploration, the kind of stuff that I've been doing for the last, however, too long. But the thing that really gets me is you don't have to go to really deep parts of the ocean to discover new things. There's one of the things I really want to do. Now I've met David just this week. I want to get one of his open ROVs that I can put in a backpack and I can just carry it down to my beach where I walk my dogs because there's this really cool pier at the edge of the harbor. And the local guys that come down and go fishing there, I know they come down at the end of the pier because they know if you go there at the right change of the tide, there's all these fish migrations. And I just worked out now, well, I can just go down with an open ROV. I want to go see what that looks like under the water. You know, and boats come to and fro there. Nobody's ever seen that. That's discovery for me as well. And I promise if you went down there, you went down to that pier and you brought that ROV and you drove it under there, you, whoever's there, let's say there's 15, 20 fishermen, I guarantee you, you have 15 or 20 more people who would be that much more interested, that much more excited. I mean, we just we just dropped this ROV in the hotel pool the other night. And you watch these kids just they're glued to it, they're excited about it, they want to build their own, they want to go out and explore. So I think, you know, that's that's really exciting. It's just when you show the people the technology and what they can do, it's just it's just like cracking the door open and there's all this other cool stuff that's happening that, that they can do, you know, that they'll definitely be interested in. Don, I wanted to get your, uh, sorry, Don Walsh, since we have two Dons on here. Uh, I wanted to get your perspective coming from this experience of being an ocean elder and seeing the evolution of ocean exploration. What are your perspectives on where things are heading with this more openness, this more citizen engagement, and this more open access to ocean data and ocean exploration? Well, our community has... Uh the ocean community, as I grew up in it over the last 50 years, has been sort of close-knit. I don't know if that's the nature of sailors. You go out to sea and it's kind of a solitary life or what. But uh, we have been sitting on a lot of stuff, and now we have all these wonderful facilitators in the, in the, uh, in the nature of uh, affordable ROVs, uh, even affordable AUVs, uh, more access to manned submersibles for worthy projects. And uh, I think in the future, in my view, uh, a lot of the important work is going to be done in the deep ocean trenches because, uh, as we know from the uh, idea of plate tectonics, the mid-ocean ridges are the spreading centers where new sea floors being created. And uh, they're pretty well studied. Then, you know, that's where the, the smokers live, the black, the white, and the transparent smokers. And they're very photogenic and not too deep, around 3,000 meters, maybe 2,700 meters. But that seafloor is being created, and our planet's not swelling up. So therefore, it's being consumed somewhere. And those are the deep, deep trenches, and most of them in the Pacific, the so-called um, uh, zone of a ring of fire. And we really haven't done anything. So you know, you only want to study one end of that transmission belt where the crust, our Earth's crust is being created, but what, what are the processes when it goes away? We have a general sort of rough idea of, of what the processes are down there, but uh, when I was out with Jim last year and he dove into the Challenger Deep, the Marianas Trench, uh, just some teasing little hints of the uh, 
uh, biological wealth down in microbiology, microbiological wealth, very, very exciting. And I think we've got to get back to those places. They only represent 2% of the total area of the seafloor. And, uh, you know, if you can dive a submersible to 20,000 feet or 6,000 meters, then you can look at 98% of the seafloor. Cost-benefit ratio is pretty nice to build for a little over half the maximum depth in the ocean and get 98% performance out of it. But that leaves aside that 2% or the deep trenches, which are virtually unstudied right now. That 2%, by the way, in the nature of uh, area is about the same as the continent of the United States, half of Mexico, and Alaska. So it's worth doing, but it's mainly worth doing because we don't know a lot about the trench processes except in a very, very crude way. So I think the heavy lifting and that kind of deep ocean hadal research, if you will, will be done by unmanned vehicles, the heavy lifting, AUVs, ROVs, probably more AUVs because they're not tethered. But there's always going to be room for manned exploration, the trained mind and the trained eye at the work site. Whether you uh, agree with the late Roger Ravel when asked why man, he said because you can't surprise an instrument, or if you agree with Jim, uh, uh, Jim Cameron last year who said what kid wants to grow up to be a robot. If there's something there. You know, when we landed an unmanned vehicle on the moon, I didn't go outside and look up there, and goody, we put a machine up there. But when uh, Neil and uh, Buzz were up there, I went outside and I looked up there and said, there's one of me, there's one of me up there. So we can't leave out that intangible of human curiosity and human involvement. And uh, I, I think it's wonderful that we're getting more and more public involvement with the oceans because we've got to feed that human curiosity. It's a very competitive world. If we want to send people to Mars and do this and that, spend enormous sums of money, when we haven't really had a real mission to planet Earth. So we really have to focus on this manned satellite where we're all living, because if we don't, the water's going to come around our knees, and we're going to wonder what happened, and we're not going to be prepared. So this public involvement and things like David's doing, making these machines accessible to people. Reminds me of the early days, David, of Heath Kits. I don't know if you go back that far, but you can make all kinds of exotic radios and electronic things, buy these kits and put them all together. Long gone now because you've got robots that stamp these things out and they give them to you free prizes if you open a bank account. But early days, that's where it started. And of course, that's what you're doing with your entry level, lower cost vehicles. At the same time, they're being met by downsizing of sensors that only sip power, have low cube, the kind of stuff that our JPL, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, is sending out into space, solar system. We can use all that stuff. Technology transfer is bought and paid for by our taxpayers. And that kind of thing. So there's convergence of low-cost vehicle technology and low-cost sensor systems. And that's going to invoke a lot of the public. Just like you were saying, Chris, go to the end of the pier and you're going to attract a crowd. That's what I call real crowd sourcing because <laughs> look at what you're doing and they're going to tell their neighbors. You know how that is. One person tells another and pretty soon got 10 people learn about it. And uh, I'm very excited about all this. I'm not sure about having a whole lot of, uh, 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 can I use the term, civilians out of my research ship. It's hard enough trying to do science at sea without having the additional burden of having to train a lot of people about what you're doing. But there's a time and a place. And I think the time and the place is what you've demonstrated, David, and what Chris has been talking about. It's very important. Uh, end of the morning lesson. Thank you. Well, you did definitely give us quite a lot to chew on there. Everything from the difference between a HOV or a ROV, which I would love to delve into in uh, the last portion of our conversation. But you also talked about the exploration of the trenches. And uh, it was pointed out in the chat behind the scenes that if we hadn't have explored those areas, that we wouldn't have found those vents and know anything about those actual ecosystems in those areas. And I believe that Don, uh, Deep Sea Don, you had uh, some interesting footage. Let, let, Andrew, let me just interject one thing that Chris can address, because that's it, kind of important what you just said. That is, when they found the deep sea vents with Alvin, his submersible, I believe that expedition was a, a, the purpose of geology off the coast of South America, and no biologists aboard, but the big discovery was visiting another planet in an entire life system that we really didn't know much about on this planet that we're on. 
a parallel life system that knows nothing of the sun. So they had to sort of send out, like for pizza, they had to send out for some biologists and revisit this place. So that's a serendipity. And, and, and that, you know, that's the essence of exploration they're trying to get at the last two days here. You don't know what you're going to find. And, and to Congress and people pay the bills, that's not sufficient. Tell us what you're going to find, then we'll give you money. We don't know how to do that. You know, exploration is the uh, uh, predecessor to research. And I think that story of the Alvin and finding something else when they weren't looking for it uh, otherwise uh, is, is very important. And, and that involves deep sea exploration and Chris is submer submersible. So, Don, Sorry, you, Don. You, put on, you paint an amazing picture. I just had a mental image of phone ordering biologists to study thermocytophils. Um, I'm going to throw it back to uh, Deep Sea Dawn, and she has some amazing footage here. What are we looking at? So I, I really, uh, of course, agree with everything that, that Don Walsh has said, and I'm really glad that he pointed out the, the need to study our ocean trenches, so sort of as the other end of the plate tectonic spectrum where uh, seafloor is being uh, destroyed instead of being created. This is also where the great earthquakes are coming from that generate the tsunamis that uh, uh, pose a uh, great danger to us, as we know from the, the uh, Japanese tsunami. But, uh, Andrew, you had asked me before about why we only have so much, uh, just so little of the ocean floor and the oceans in general uh, studied at a sufficient level of detail to understand these processes. And I hope this image is showing a uh, fishnet uh, mesh in the background which shows the topography that has been estimated. The topography of the ocean floor has been estimated from satellites. But when we go uh, to see uh, with ships and also now with these autonomous underwater vehicles and these ROVs, that seafloor comes alive in greater detail. And this is along the Tonga Trench, which is south of the Mariana, where Don and James Cameron and colleagues went. And the Tonga Trench is the site of Horizon Deep, which is the second deepest spot on our planet, which is uh, over 10,000 meters in depth or 6.2 miles in depth. So uh, I think this, I wanted to share this graphic if it's coming through clearly, which I hope it is, to show that it's like peeling back an orange and you're discovering uh, the fruits underneath and reach and the, uh, the exploration is the precursor to, to the, uh, the greater science and the greater uh, benefits that we can, we can gain from this. But we do have to explore first. So thank you. No, that's a fantastic point, fantastic area. Um, before we move on too much more about more of the science, I wanted to uh, mention a little bit, uh, draw back a little bit about what Don Walsh actually mentioned earlier. And this was on the concept of nobody wants to grow up to be a robot. And there's not that human element of surprise uh, when you're not quite in there. This uh, last Thursday, at the California Academy of Science at their nightlife exhibit, they had a whole bunch of people in the external area demonstrating ROVs. And I got into a conversation with one of them in preparation for this conversation about the difference between her experience in being in a submersible, looking through the porthole and discovering something versus looking through a screen. And there seems to be this big difference between the, uh, you know, the remote experience and the human experience and uh, Megan you seem to have a, uh, a anecdote in regards to that as well about the difference between the human experience and, and the actual data. Can you speak a little bit to that? Uh, you're, you're muted currently? Sorry. There we are, unmuted. Um, a big part of my role when I was out on board the Nautilus ship is we do live interactions with museums and science centers and classrooms all around the world. We do about 20 of these live shows a day uh, which is an open mic for kids and excited young explorers to ask questions to the team that's on board the ship. And um, it's very, uh, it's, it's so thrilling. It um, really keeps you on your toes to know what they might ask next. But even when we were talking about deep sea reefs, coral reefs in the deep sea that are thousands of years, some built on structures that are tens of thousands of years, um, mapping new things, talking about the oil spill. There were a lot of topics going around. And the question it always came back to is, what did you have for lunch? How big is your bed that you live on on the ship? 
Um, what do you do during your free time? Can you go to the gym? Uh, can you play outside? You know, these are the questions that people want to know about ocean explorers because it's not just about the data. Um, I think a big reason why the oceans aren't explored is it's hard for people to visualize what these depths look like. It's hard for them to make that personal connection, but people can understand the excitement of going on a boat or what that might be like or what it might be like to get to drive an ROV or what it might be like to get to um, wobble around when the seas are bumpy. And I think that human element is so key that you have to pair the data. Here's an interesting thing we learned with here's an interesting thing that we learned about ourselves or how you could be involved as well. So it's always fun to see those questions coming in. So this has been a fantastic conversation so far and I wish that it could go on for another like three, four hours with more participants coming in. Um, but it looks like we only have about five minutes left and we have a large area to cover, everything from the surface of the ocean down to the seafloor and the ocean uh, volume in between, and it's going to be relatively impossible, as everybody on this call knows, to hit every single portion, not just with uh, human-operated exploration, but also with ROVs. So I would like to give everybody a couple of minutes just to wrap up about their thoughts on uh, the future of ocean exploration, and about where uh, they think that you know we should be headed and if we're going in the right direction. I also would like to give those who have uh, been at Ocean Exploration 2020 a little bit of an opportunity to speak to what that experience has also been like. Uh, Chris and David, I want to throw it to you guys first. First of all, thank you so much for being a part of this awesome conversation. Thank you so much for being here. And you know, Hello? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. No, you good. So um, I just always want to remind people, I don't know who's watching or how many people are watching, but I, I didn't have a background in this, you know, even as it's, it's close as a few years ago. And so it's, e e even if you're out there and, you, and this is something you haven't dug into yet, but, you, but you're interested and you're, you're curious, I I just would extend the invitation to, to join this and to and to to follow that curiosity and try and get involved because there are ways the technology is changing. Um, and it's one thing I, l I learned this weekend is that the, the, the ocean explorers, these people I've kind of grown to, to look up to and thought that there was just something that I could never do, um, are actually very open to including um, you know, these citizen explorers in the process. And I think that's really exciting. Um, and I hope if you're interested that you, that you decide to get involved. I think I'll just add it to that. I mean, one of the things from the technology, I mean, the great thing about robotic technology is it allows this democratization of how we actually get to share the information we do. But um, I think it's it's also true, I think it was Megan was saying that point as well, but the human involvement, um, I actually do have a son who does want to grow up to be a robot, but, you know, he's a bit weird. Um, but, the, um, but I think, you know, that, that human expedition, it's actually something that actually both ocean and space science has learned alike. We've just been working on building the new version of Alvin, and people have said, so why are you doing that when you already have all these great robots as well? And and it is true that the, the best scientific mind or the best scientific instrument we have is still the human brain. And there isn't anything if the, if there was a virtual reality headset that could actually really capture what it's like to actually be there at the bottom of the ocean in the submarine and looking out the viewport, then not only would we be using it, we're pretty sure you know the military would have it and you'd be able to buy it with your best game stations as well. Maybe another generation from now you will be able to simulate the reality of being somewhere. But right now it's it just you know I think we're closer than you think. I would totally play that game. Uh, Deep Sea Dawn, your final thoughts. Uh, I just think, and I'm going to, to share uh, one final image here, I, I just think it's uh, fantastic that we've had this uh, discussion uh, about exploring the inner space uh, of our planet as opposed to outer space. And uh, this is a quest. Uh, this is something that is not only compelling uh, in terms of being fun and cool and fantastic, but it's also something that is still critical to the survival of our planet. And it's something that we all need to participate in. So I'm so glad about these discussions in terms of citizen uh, exploration, citizen participation, and again, uh, the ROVs and uh, all of the, the different uh, great toys that we're using are going to help us to understand the water in between the seafloor and the sea surface, such as this column. Uh, of water, it's a visualization uh, of that that we have been working on at Esri with universities in Hampshire. But it's also something that 
when I, when I say all of us, it means uh, men and women, people of different uh, ethnic backgrounds as well, uh, people from Polynesia, African Americans, uh, Latinas. Well, we all need to really get jazzed about our oceans. It's, it's for all of us, and we all need to uh, to dream together. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for all the amazing footage and data. Uh, looking forward to more representations on Esri data, Esri maps, and more collaboration uh, between all the different groups working on stuff. Megan, I want to throw it to you. What are your final thoughts? Uh, uh, Megan, you're, you're muted again. <laughs> there we go. Um, I'm just so honored and thrilled to get to be part of this conversation. And I just want to mirror those thoughts of others to invite other people to be part of this conversation as well. We don't just need scientists and engineers. We need people who will um, talk about oceans over their coffee or mention it to their neighbor or their grandkid and just help share this enthusiasm. I would invite people to come along to the exploration that's happening now, um, as well as keep dreaming about what the future will hold. I'll screen share here Exploration Now. This is the hub, um, the collaborative hub for all the ships with the telepresence technology streaming exploration throughout the summer. Um, you have the Nautilus, the Okeanos Explorer, the RV Atlantis, the RV Thompson, and the RV Falcor will also be online. Um, later throughout the season and this is something you can uh, put on in your desktop background at work um, have someone ask a question share something cool you saw there today and I just hope people will um, come along and join us we have so much left to learn I'm gonna look forward to uh, asking all you guys tons of questions and little details and uh, sharing that across the board Don Walsh I'm gonna give you the final word from our guests Okay, it's simply this. Come on in. The water's fine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is fantastic. Thank you all for all of our guests. Um, I guess if I had any final thoughts on this, it would be that all of these conversations that I've been monitoring through Ocean Exploration 2020, this conversation here, the breakout sessions, it seems that there are some exciting things on the horizon for ocean exploration, everything from more human uh, exploration and possibly a fleet of citizen-operated and controlled ROVs helping to collect and analyze data, and that seems like an exciting, interesting future. So from the Online Ocean Symposium, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Thank you to my amazing guests, and hopefully you can come on for our uh, future conversations as well. Thank you, everybody, and have a great rest of the day. Thank you. See you.